So, we have Christos from Greece here. Uh, it's hard not to notice him. <laughs> uh, but he needs only one mic, as the rest of us. Ordinarily, I need no mic. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, he will introduce us to uh, Bartle Taxonomy of Players. Please, give it up for him, for Christos. Thank you. So I had a preemptive question, actually, just as we were having this break. What is taxonomy? Taxonomy is uh, basically taking a large set of uh, subjects, like maybe animals, and breaking them down into categories so you can study them more effectively. Uh, Bartle taxonomy of uh, players uh, is basically taking all the players that are playing LARP for fun, and this is important, I will get back to it uh, later, and uh, getting des describing them in discrete categories so you can study them as a, as a whole group and the interactions they have with other groups. So, this guy is Richard Allen Bartle. He was uh, a software, uh, a computer scientist, well, he is a computer science actually, in the University of Essex, born in 1960. He, is, well, he has been around. And uh, in 1978, with another guy, they made a MUD, a multi-user dungeon. This was the first time, like in human history, that people sat across each other in uh, different computers and they played a game together, like a virtual, proper virtual world. Uh, they were using text, of course, uh, think of uh, like all the text adventures and uh, the like that have been uh, around that uh, time available, but for multiple people across the, across the, across the internet. So, uh, this guy, well, he, after he developed the MUD, he got his players together in forums and stuff, and uh, he started talking to them. Oh, why do you like my game? Why do you play? Why do you play for fun in a, in a world that is not our world, that has been constructed. It has rules, specifications. You are not playing yourself, you are playing a character, and you are interacting with that world and other characters in that world. And during those discussions, he had uh, many results that he compiled together in what uh, he called the suits, the suits of uh, players. I will explain uh, later. At the end of that, he published that paper, and he then he wrote a book about it. This is his address. I will link the, um, the presentation online so you can check out his stuff. He has done other stuff that is actually really important about uh, sociology and games and how uh, people interact with their environment and other players. So, why do we care about a guy building a program in 1978? and, uh, you know, making people play online. So, first of all, when you are uh, coding a virtual world, you are actually having what we have in LARP, but much more controlled. You do not have uh, variables like weather. You do not have uh, variables like uh, uh, random people wandering in. It's a much more controlled environment, so any assumptions you make about that environment are more uh, reliable. And every observation that you make about uh, your environment and your players and this whole system uh, is more accurate. Also, uh, basically, this is the first instance in humanity that uh, people got together and had uh, a virtual world that uh, had uh, inbuilt um, mechanics. They were not agreed upon beha uh, beforehand. They did not rely on a social contract, basically, to keep those mechanics in place. They were just assumed to be there because, well, you couldn't do anything in a game. You had text and you could write certain commands. Some commands would be accepted, some others wouldn't. He did a very good documentation of uh, what his players uh, said to him in, he, in all those uh, forums and uh, what uh, exactly he, the numbers were in different mods that were available at the time and what this all means. It's all very, very detailed and I thank him for it. You should too. <laughs> so after that, he developed uh, a theory on, on why those interactions happen. Like he made some observations like, okay, so why do different uh, kinds of people, different kinds of players, interact this way with others. And uh, there is a whole system behind it, we'll see it uh, in a bit. And finally, he published his findings, which is why are we having this talk today. So, this is what he called the original paper. Hearts, clubs, diamonds, and spades. 
He did this because, well, hearts are supposed to be the socialites, as, uh, as he called them, the socializers, sorry, as he called them, uh, the people who, you know, like uh, social contact within uh, the context of the game, and, you know, hearts because socializers. Uh, he called uh, diamonds, uh, the guys who like to get loot, uh, you know, increase their stats, power game and stuff because they want all the loot, they want all the treasure. He called spades the explorers because, well, explorers want to dig stuff up, literally and figuratively, depending on what your game is. And he called killers clubs because they hit each other with them. So, some, uh, first some disclaimers. Uh, this has been uh, published in 1993 or 4. Uh, it has been written uh, some years prior. So, some parts of it are out there. If you go read it right now, it will seem a bit weird. Uh, a lot of stuff has happened since then. Computer games are not the same. Sociology is not the same. Humanity is not the same. Uh, if, I, if you ever hear me calling them archetypes or suites, they are the same thing. Uh, this, is, uh, this is for clarity. So, also, suites are not about characters. I, uh, they are not about player uh, stereotypes, and they are not about the, uh, the combination of uh, any uh, kind of uh, character that is somebody is playing in a fantasy setting or a sci-fi setting. Those all don't matter. The player is the only thing that matters. How the player approaches the game uh, in, an individual, uh, in an individual way to obtain enjoyment out of it. Um, yes, uh, also this, uh, this only applies to games after, um, uh, after a certain size, like in very small games. For example, the games that we have played here, uh, maybe it applies, but it's already on the fringes. After you go after a certain threshold, after 20, 30 players, and after you let players uh, uh, make their own characters, it becomes really apparent. So there is a gradient. Uh, sometimes it doesn't apply, sometimes it does. Uh, but generally, if your game is bigger, and if your game has characters made by the players, it applies more. Uh, also, players uh, might have characteristics from different, uh, different suits, but they are uh, identified as only being one suit at a time. So they may be very close to the boundary with, uh, with another suit, but for uh, simple them to be only one suit. However, they do change over time. Like somebody who has started out as an achiever might drift out and become uh, an explorer over time because his interests changed, uh, his uh, personality changed, uh, maybe the game has changed to a certain degree and he, it is pushing him that way and he still tries to find um, enjoyment out of the game, which makes him change tactics. So, to understand the battle taxonomy, first we need to understand the space. A space has two axes, focus and engagement. Focus is basically when you are, uh, when you are approaching the game, what are you are interested in? Are you interested in the other people playing the game, the agents? Or are you interested in the world and uh, the underlying mechanics and everything that comes with it? Engagement, acting with and acting upon. So when you're acting with somebody, uh, it is... Um, Change. Something is given, something is taken. It is a symbiotic relationship. You change them, but they change you as well. If you act, if you try to act upon them, you are changing them in a way that implies that you have mastery over the world or, or mastery over the over the agents. So, the world is anything built into the fictional universe. Uh, everything from uh, mechanics. Obstructions, physical objects, anything that the DMs uh, have, uh, the GMs have brought in, uh, everything that uh, is part of the scenery, everything that is part of the mechanics, everything that does not have free will, it is unlike the subject, the player. So, I have free will. Something else that you know is unmoving. Maybe even it has a voice, like uh, the um, the speakers that Elena showed us uh, yesterday. <coughs> They might have many characteristics, they might even pass information along and might be even, in a sense, active players, but they do not have free will. They are unlike me, who I'm the subject. Agents are 
people like you and me. I understand with my innate theory of mind as a person that you are like me and you have a brain and we see the same reality basically. We make some processes and then we produce output. Anything that is like me and I can basically see across a mirror uh, is another agent. So, acting with. Uh, basically, activities that promote synergy. When, uh, when, we, when we are talking about synergy, as I said, it's kind of a symbiosis. You have uh, attributes and actions from both sides contributing to uh, some greater than its parts. When you are, have uh, uh, when you have acting upon, it, they, it is an implied mastery, a one-way action. I am blocking whatever there is uh, that I am acting upon from interacting with me, while I shape it, change it, um, make, uh, make it uh, according to my will, to my new view of it, to my specifications. Which brings us here. Uh, can, you all, can you read this? This, I don't know because I expect, you know. Uh, so, this is the this is the diagram. Uh, you have uh, fo uh, you have focus here, across agents the world, and um, engagement on the vertical axis, acting upon, acting with. On the four corners are the basically extremes, like uh, people who only derive enjoyment uh, by acting upon the world here and people we, who, only, uh, who only gain enjoyment by acting with the agents here. And uh, you can be like uh, anywhere, on, uh, anywhere on the spectrum, like close to the center, you are not really we are not really able to identify what kind of player you are. Uh, when you are in the boundaries, you are you know, maybe tiptoeing between uh, uh, two shoots uh, for any, at any given uh, moment and switching between them because of the game or because of the company. You are keeping you know, small things that might influence you both ways. When you are firmly in the center, we say that, uh, okay, you might, uh, you might have like, uh, different actions within the game, but you are primarily an achiever, or primarily an explorer, primarily a socializer, or a killer. So, achievers, players who set arbitrary goals and take steps to accomplish them. This is uh, your basic player in a sense that uh, old RPGs and old MMOs used to design this way. There are people who want numbers, they want, there are people who want loot, there are people who want to a uh, step-by-step -step increase of their characters and doing stuff, getting recognized for that stuff, and uh, pushing on onwards and upwards. They like to act upon the world because they see it as uh, um, playground. a playground. Not, not exactly a playground, a scene, uh, a stage. They are there to show how, how awesome they are, in a sense, and accomplish things that for everybody to see. Explorers. Uh, players who want to learn and discover as much as possible. They, they like information, they like knowledge, they like to find out what you haven't, even if you're the game master. Like, yes, they want to go even beyond your bounds. They do not recognize um, a limit to, okay, yes, you have such and such knowledge, you should stop, just do something else. They, they really want to get more and more and more. And this is what drives them. This is what makes them like to play. This will bring them to the game uh, week after week or month after month or year after year. Socializers, players who are interested in connecting with people. They are basically the machine that fuels the whole, this whole construction because they talk to people all the time and they like talking to people and they like talking, people talking back and uh, they like uh, organizing and they like uh, uh, sending people to uh, you know, tell other people stuff and convey information and you know, expanding a bubble of fuzziness and love until it encompasses the whole game. Killers. Players that derive their main form of satisfaction from imposing themselves among others. This is a doozy. Uh, achievers like to impose on the world, which is fine. I mean, it's a world where we made it. You might find that you're a little darling and might not like what uh, a change that a player makes. This one, this one is a bit of a problem. I mean, there are other people on the receiving end of this. So, a bit more... Uh, 
uh, analytical. Achievers are uh, objective oriented. Uh, they want to set, uh, set up goals and accomplish them. This might be with uh, a strategy or very, um, uh, very spontaneous. So um, an achiever might uh, go, through, go through a campaign or a forest or some kind of uh, player that you have designed and uh, might be looking for stuff to do. And if something picks here is interest, he's going to follow that quest. He's uh, going to go after that uh, fabled item. He's going to uh, um, go with uh, an army against uh, in a battle to achieve some goal, to gain victory because somebody uh, convinced him of his, uh, um, of his uh, aspirations and ambitions. Uh, basically, when they act upon the world, uh, they like to get um, mechanical benefits or symbols of status. Basically, it's not about getting more powerful. It's about recognizing, yes, I have made my mark on the world. I have changed things. And I want this to be recognized both uh, inside me and on, uh, on the world as a whole. Uh, they will go to great lengths to, say, do something that might be even impossible or something that is outside of what you have uh, thought about because it sounds cool, or it gives them some fringe benefit that marks them as different from everybody else. So for example, uh, you might have a quest that is intended for, uh, like say, a fantasy game. Uh, that is an object that is going to be used at the third day of the event for another quest. But you have put some uh, kind of mechanic on this object, and now whoever holds it has some Small effect, like it doesn't even need to. It doesn't even need to be much. Like, say that uh, when he walks into the tavern, the barkeep greets him. Like simple stuff. Um, the achiever will go after it, even if he's not interested in the later quest. It might be uh, a, sim a very important key for that quest, but he doesn't care. He cares that whoever holds this egg, say, gets greeted by the barkeep. This marks me as special. I have changed the world. The barkeep now greets me every time I step, every time I step into the tavern. They're very proud of their, uh, for their, of their accomplishments. Formal and in, informal. Uh, formal might be something like, OK, I have led my army to victory. This is recognized in the game. And my faction has won a war. Or my faction has uh, uh, obtained their objective. We have all gone uh, home, and we are happy with ourselves. Or it might be something informal, like, Say, I want to charge like a formation of people in a buffer lap and survive until I kill two people. Uh, simple stuff. I have, uh, it's, not about, it's not about the people, it's about doing something that marks me as different from everybody else. Other people in the game, they are uh, competition or allies. So I want to say, do, uh, make a goal, so okay, slay the dragon, for example. And people are either going to help me, or they're going to try to get there first. And uh, this depends on the goal. If it's a cooperative goal, they will tend to look for allies. If it is a goal that uh, is more single-oriented, uh, single they will try to get to it first uh, from, to prevent others from doing so. Explorers. They like things that are new. Uh, things that they have discovered, and it doesn't have to be lore. It can be mechanics. Uh, an explorer can be the guy who reads the rule book again and again and again and again, and tries to find some interesting combination of spells that produce an effect that nobody else has thought of. It doesn't matter if it's powerful. It doesn't matter if it's useful. It matters that he found it first. And he will treasure that knowledge, and he will tell everybody about it, that, hey, I'm the guy who found this, uh, this thing, and it is awesome, and how, how awesome we all are, because we found uh, you know, different stuff. And he will turn your world upside down. If you have, uh, most explorers will stretch uh, your, um, your capability as a DM to uh, put uh, strict, um, strict boundaries on the wall to the limit. And they will try to claw at those walls, until you either tear them down or basically make them run to a circle so that they keep themselves happy 
while not uh, breaking some glass box you have around the world that needs not to be breathed because you have some other uh, mechanical considerations or some kind of uh, uh, other, um, other objective in mind. They act with the world in the sense that they let the world uh, lead them places. They have no clear objective yet. They just go from location to location trying to find something interesting. Give them a hook, they are instantly hooked. They do not have to be convinced to go on a quest. Just imply that at the other side of this quest there is something interesting, something new. They will go on that quest and they will find ways to um, justify to themselves, to their character, they will try to find uh, to try to find ways to justify to others, and they will have fun. They are proud of, in, of their in-depth knowledge, uh, especially obscure stuff like uh, topics and mechanics, and they do not like when it is taken away. Uh, they do not like when things are getting simplified. They do not like when their uh, uh, newfound um, uh, discoveries are getting nullified because, oh, some change in the game uh, made this obsolete. It is okay, however, if you take something away and open up a new, uh, a new unknown frontier, a new uh, avenue of exploration that they can again delve themselves, delve themselves in and find out new stuff. So basically, in a sense, explorers, for example, say you are doing a buffer game and you wipe away all the rules, or you're doing a vampire game and you wipe away all the rules, and you introduce new rules, <coughs> most of the time, they won't mind because you just took away something that they already knew. Maybe they have already explored to the limit and given them something new and sparkly. They will tear down on these new rules, on this lore, on whatever you are changing to find again uh, what, uh, what is there to be discovered. Uh, other players are either companions on the journeys, in the sense that uh, they would like to uh, go through the experience of finding stuff together, not exactly the, um, the quest or the, uh, you know, the mechanical obstacles that need to be overcome. Those are not very important to explorers. They're companions in the exploration itself, in the uh, experience of uh, finding new stuff. Or annoyances. Anybody who's stopping an explorer from going further, uh, digging the next rock because he, go, he interrupts him, uh, he pesters him, he whatever, uh, makes the explorer very annoyed at this. Because the explorer wants to keep doing stuff. He doesn't want to deal with things outside of his enjoyment zone, basically. Socializers. Well, they're social. Um, they sometimes are leaders and they are, correct, they are coordinating people, they are uh, getting uh, large groups of people together to work on a single goal, or they are, what do you say, the, the, heart of the, part, the, um, the heart of the party. They might be by the campfire, they get others to tell stories, they tell stories themselves, they um, engage people uh, in a way that uh, brings out their uh, social nature and makes your game more immersive in a sense. Without many socializers in, uh, in a game, you will find that people just tend to move from one point to another. Yes, they have some role-playing experience, of course, among each other, because this is not a computer game. This is, uh, we're talking about LARP. But uh, you will not find those uh, interactions that are purely uh, social without, no, without any tangible uh, effect in the, the world or another player. Uh, they are proud of the social standing influence, uh, contacts and friends. Basically, they want to get to know people, and the more they are able to do that, they remain happy. They are actually, uh, I consider them the easiest of the four groups to deal with, uh, because they self-manage in a way. They keep their own uh, keep their own bubble that generates their own uh, their own fun, their own engagement, and you don't really have to plan. Uh, so much around them, um, except that you have to give them space to do their uh, their thing. The rest of the the rest of the players who the rest of, the rest of the players are the actual content of the game for them. They are here for the people. Everything else is like the things to talk about with those other players. So okay, your lore might be very interesting, and that dragon might seem very menacing, but he doesn't care. 
He wants to know what happened when the brave adventurer that went and uh, slew the dragon, what he felt, how will he tell his wife that he slew an innocent or, you know, terrible creature, depending on the situation. He wants to know if the creature was innocent or terrible. This is what, this is what gives them enjoyment. And then you have killers. Killers want, as I said, to not influence, but um, exert their will on other players. In buffer labs, it's usually straightforward. Just grab a sword and come at you all the time because they like it, because they like seeing you on the floor, basically. It's not about tactics. It's not about battles. It's not about whose banner stands on the top of the hill. That's the achievers. They, they care about the banner. They're the guys who want to see bodies on the floor. And they feel good about it. Problem is, most of the time, this makes other players feel bad. And when I say most times, well, sometimes they will you know, be, decent, uh, be decent people and uh, expect uh, the player who is dying, for example, by their blade to play after death. Uh, they will share in that, uh, in that experience. But most of the time, they don't care. Like, the, at the point that they have bested you, at the point that they have demonstrated their superiority, you are no longer relevant. You are part of the scenery. They won't care when somebody comes to take revenge with you. And they won't care, for example, if uh, there is some punishment for them. It's not important. And it's not important to the player. It doesn't matter what the character ha has uh, in mind. Maybe the player bends to the will of the character, or it's the other way around. But the player gets the enjoyment from seeing you of the dirt. A variant of this is uh, on more political heavy games are the guys who don't just want to win to you know, rule the city. They want to see you fall. They will scheme and scheme and scheme so that when you do your epic reveal, especially if you are like a very influential player uh, in terms of the game, they want to see that smile off your face. They want to see you betrayed at the last possible moment. They want to see your victory turned into defeats. They act upon agents by controlling their circumstances and demonstrating, as I said, superiority or asserting uh, the kind of control that drives them. Sometimes it's about control as in, I want to control your actions. Sometimes the control is just, yes, I have been to you now, you have to go to the infirmary. Nya, 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 nya. Very, very simplistic and very um, childish behavior, but we see it. Again and again, we observe it in, in, those, in those contexts. Some might say that it's just the immature players. I think not. I think this is uh, much deeper. So, other players for them, well, first, uh, they're proud of your reputation, good or bad. So, when you, when you go to a killer and like, dude, you're like the guy who kills everybody and people don't like you. They revel in that. They, they feel awesome. They feel like they have changed the fucking world and they are on top of it. Tell them that people don't like them and you will make them the happiest people in the world. All the other players to them are victims or allies. So basically people that they can beat up or exploit or people they can't, so they want to work with them to exploit other people who can exploit or, uh, or uh, victimize. You can also see a pattern, I'm, I'm guessing you will see a pattern from the way I'm speaking that I'm not very, fun, I'm not very fond of this. Like, in general, uh, literature on the subject considers all four types as valid. In LARP, I don't think this is the case. Maybe in a computer game where you have the screen and the internet and another computer between you and the other guy. But when you are deriving pleasure from bringing somebody down face to face, yes, this is not just uh, you know, a, a style of play. This is a kind of psychopathy to a degree. So. This is, the, this is the influence chart. I'm guessing that you cannot see it, so I will explain briefly. 
First of all, the explosion and the socializers, those uh, circles here. Basically, this means, so to read this, uh, every, uh, every um, arrow that uh, has a green body means uh, that it exerts an influence based on the positive change of population. So when the, explorers, uh, when the explorer population increases, this makes the killers decrease, for example. Socializers have both feedback loops, which means when you get more socializers in your game, because, well, they are extrovert people probably, they will find more people and bring them into your game. And this will balloon out of control. In addition, if socializers start leaving your game, it makes them feel alone. So they also leave the game because their friends left the game. And it's also a feedback loop that diminishes their population. Achievers and killers have an antagonistic relationship because they, are both, uh, they both want to be masters of the universe. They both want to exert their will, either in their world or in their players. They will antagonize each other at every corner. But uh, when achievers, for example, uh, increase, in, uh, increase in population, this will increase the population of killers. This is usually because some achievers uh, uh, slide over, because when you have a lot of, uh, a lot of achievers that get attacked by, by killers, some of them just start switching to killers to uh, kill the killers, which makes them the same thing because, as I said, it's not about what your character wants, it's about what the player wants. If the player has so much of it that he now has, has started getting enjoyment from killing other players, he's sliding from an achiever to a killer. An increase of population of killers, though, will decrease the population of achievers. And the decrease of population of achievers will decrease the population of killers. This is a semi-stable relationship, uh, because if uh, a change happens and it starts to trend a certain way, they will equalize and reduce or increase their population in a stable, in a stable rate. This is, of course, assuming that this is a, a complete system that contains all killers, achievers, explorers, and socializers in the um, amounts and uh, um, quantity that we, we usually observe them. Killers and socializers, this is a volatile relationship. Any, any decrease in killers will increase socializers by a lot, like you see how big the arrow is here. So even if you take away very few killers from your game, your socializer population will jump significantly. The reverse is also, also true. So even if you introduce a few more killers in your game, socializer population will drop. Because they not only get annoyed, they understand this, uh, what I talked about before, that is this slight psychopathy, <laughs> this... Um, uh, this getting enjoyment from hurting other people's games. Socializers are very good on seeing that because they're, they, usually they are good empaths. They can understand the motivations of people and when they see that, like, okay, this, going, this game is going downhill now. And they leave. Uh, this weak relationship don't really matter with the explorers. Like, explorers do their own thing usually and they have their own feedback loop and do not... Uh, uh, do not interact much, um, despite having very big arrows. This is because the graph was not that good. Um, and the achievers with the socializers uh, have uh, always, no matter what you do, if you increase the achievers, uh, socializers will be reduced. If you decrease the achievers, socializers will also be reduced. Because when you have, uh, when you have socializers alone without achievers, like, okay, so we will talk about all our stuff. We will talk about all our problems. We will talk about all the problems of your family, your family, your family, our family, our clan, the world. We will philosophize. And then what? We have nothing more to talk about. We'll just stand across the campfire and look at each other. They want achievers to change stuff up. They want to change the world. They want to uh, cause changes. Oh, OK, now we can talk about the change. Because that guy stormed that castle, and now uh, it belongs to another faction. So this has a lot of uh, possibilities and changes, and people are backstabbing themselves uh, in each other, and there are switches of allegiance, and uh, shops are closing, shops are opening, 
Uh, people are changing professions. People are joining armies. People are leaving armies. A lot of uh, a lot of stuff is happening. How much time do I have left? Shit. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it ruining the stream? Yeah. It is ruining the stream. I'm I'm really really sorry. So, from computer games to LARP, uh, basically, as I said, the battle taxonomy of players has been written about MADS. And this is, uh, this is uh, basically an attempt to map it on to what we see in LARP and the differences. In MAD, and some of the, some of the research that I have found, uh, well, all of the reasons I have found, official reasons that I have found um, on LARP and uh, battle taxonomy, they made a huge mistake, in my opinion. They judged what the players were finding enjoyment in by what actions they took. This is completely wrong because, say, I am an achiever and I go exploring. And I search uh, and I search and I search and I search for knowledge. So I search for knowledge. And you will categorize me as an explorer, but the searching doesn't matter. I want a powerful artifact because it will make me more powerful and will let me change the world. Anything that I do to obtain that, even if it maps out to a specific action that we traditionally associate with another type, it's still serving my goal of getting more powerful. So, on all this, uh, on all this uh, research, they suggested that killers were like 1%. Yes, because killers don't make actions that are different from the others. An achiever will kill, an achiever will go against other players. The motivation is different. And if you don't talk to the player, and if the player is not honest about it, you will never find out. I think that killers are actually much more prevalent uh, in all our games. And this is because LARP is unique. They get to see people getting hurt and getting battered over their, uh, over their downfall. You can't do that with video games. So it is naturally more attractive to them. They, they feed on it, like they, they like it. The immediacy of contact, this is, uh, this is what I'm saying, the immediacy of contact uh, basically makes everything that was on the right side of the graph about, uh, about agents be much, much more uh, important. So socializers are more important, killers are more important because people get a more immediate effect. And another difference that uh, we see is that, uh, well, basically in computer games, you don't have social norms acting on you. In labs, you do. Even if you are inside a magic circle and you have decided upon several different rules, well, society is still there waiting for you. You cannot change that. So, these are the ethical responsibilities I have uh, figured out based on what I just said. As a designer, you should imbue your work with the values you want to see in humanity, in society. You want to discourage actions and ways of thinking that go against humanity's aspiration, which I think is what exactly the killers are. You want to create a safe space. This is also incompatible with killers. LARP should not be a zero-sum game also incompatible with killers. For a killer to feel good, somebody else needs to feel bad. This immediately makes your game a zero-sum game. The organizers should not treat any type of player as fodder to enhance another experience. This means that, sure, you might want more people because some uh, faction has come to you and complained, oh, there are not enough people, blah, 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 blah. And you decide to you know, make an, an outreach to uh, get more people in. If you're doing this to appease that faction because they like killing people and they cannot kill everybody else because they have come to good, you're feeding them fodder. Back, yeah. Yep, they're going to come back for one event, they're going to have a terrible experience, and they're going to leave. Oh, this is a famous quote. I mean, both are, infinite, <laughs> both are awesome quotes from Star Trek. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So... To get more people happy, it means having to break some eggs. It means that the people who cannot get happy with the majority must go, unless they can change, unless they can you know, transition from one, 
player, player uh, archetype, player shoot, into another. And this is what we should all do on our games. We should all try to get killers unstuck from their place uh, in, uh, in their minds, basically, that has made them uh, appreciate this uh, way of playing, and move them into some other category, which I think they will find uh, uh, also um, uh, fulfilling. I mean, I do not think it's, uh, it is the natural state of humans to only find enjoyment in hurting others. Like, <laughs> there must be better ways for us to have fun. <laughs> so, thank you. Any questions? Uh, before we uh, mm -hmm. turn to questions, uh, I have been informed that uh, uh, Mr. Bartle was informed of, of, your, of your talk today and possibly maybe even uh, watched it. Uh, that was the first thing I was going to say. I don't think he watched it, but he says if he has done anything that could also help LARP design, he's very happy. So, one round of, of applause for Chrysos. <laughs> and one for Josephine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, questions? Oh, okay. Uh, so, I, I think it's very interesting because I think this is, might be a cultural difference because from my perspective, I'm like, I've never seen the killer type at LARPs. For me, that is like, that doesn't happen. Uh, s as you said, sometimes they show up, but since no one wants to play with them, they come once and then they leave. And so it's like a self-sorting system. Uh, I've never really seen that as a problem. I've seen some people that by accident like hurt other players, but that's not the goal. Like those who actually have it at a, at a goal, I think they... L it's easier to hurt someone else hiding behind the screen than when you actually face the consequences. And I've hardly ever met them in LARPs. The only time I think I've seen them is when we do like school LARPs where they we force people to LARP where it's mandatory. But like it's a big step to like get a costume, show up and go to a LARP. It's it's a big investment and that I don't see them do that. And this might be cultural, so I think it's really interesting. So I just would love to like is this a problem you feel you have a lot? So, uh, firstly, uh, if you force people to play, as, uh, as uh, Dr. Battle has said himself, uh, his taxonomy doesn't apply. This is about people trying to derive fun. If you force people to play, they're not trying to derive fun, they're just going along and trying to put the minimal effort to get out of it. It might be a cultural difference. The literature I have seen all suggests what you say, that uh, uh, killers are a very small minority. However, I would submit that the people who actually take pleasure from uh, hurting other people are actual, actual like uh, they have the skills of the sociopath to hide. How are you going to distinguish an achiever who is going to war to kill for his kingdom and you know raise the banner and change stuff, up, obtain the loot, uh, do stuff from a killer who actually does this for the killing and all the rest are a side benefit. If you question him and he's not honest, you are not going to be able to differentiate. That's what I said about all the literature that suggests that uh, they are, uh, they are uh, a small minority. All of their methodologies relied on, for, for example, one that specifically comes to mind and I will uh, link it uh, with uh, the presentation the, on, the portal, uh, on the portal group, uh, had a separate set of spectators that uh, overshow uh, behind uh, you know, um, a two-way mirror into a LARP room and evaluate each player according to their actions. These are people in another room and they're not mind readers. How can you evaluate somebody's motivations for taking a certain action? Because if you have a LARP that is centered around conflict, all of the actions that would uh, be assigned to a killer would probably also be assigned to an achiever. That's what I think there is, a, there is a problem in methodology there. But yes, uh, we have had that problem 
and I think that Bulgaria had that problem, and I think Croatia may have that problem, Serbia may have that problem, maybe it's a Balkan thing, maybe it's greater, I'm not so sure. No, no, it's important because I had spoken with a Danish guy in the Portal 3, and he's like, uh, when, we, uh, when we finished uh, with uh, the, the presentation, he's like, whoa, you guys see conflict like totally different as a concept. So it may be cultural, or it may be that we, do not, we have not developed the methodology to understand what uh, exactly separates a killer from an achiever, and we just rely on the superficial. Um, I wanted to touch up on the subject. So a uh, killer is a lot more difficult to root out for the many reasons Chris just said. But also, uh, we in our minds have this image of a killer as a bad guy who will inevitably expose himself, which he will not do. Anybody who derives pleasure from ruining other people's game will go to an extreme length to actually appearing exactly opposite. So. Another thing is that um, when we explore, let's say, evil NPCs or evil player characters, because we can't all be good, because if we don't have dynamic opposition, we'll never have actually fun. So when we have to step into this mind of a killer and um, ruin another person's plan, or you know, outright, you know, maybe humiliate him in a crowd of people or anything like that, you will start to realize how much work you actually have to do to, for example, stay hidden. And then when you see how much effort that takes and somebody who does that constantly, he gets really good at that. And, you know, anyways, uh, my question was also for you. So what suit would you identify with? I would say Achiever. I, for a long time, I think I kidded myself that uh, I was an explorer because I thought it was more noble. But come on, I like the stats, I like the loot, I like, the, I like to win. <laughs> All right, thanks. Hi, we will go in a row. Okay, so I have uh, two very short comments and one question. So first uh, comment would be what you also said, that methodologically it's uh, very difficult to uh, evaluate human motivation. It's one of the major problems in psychology. So we need to work on that a lot to see what, uh, what we can you know, derive from this. Second comment is that you know all this taxonomy, whether it applies or not, doesn't matter. Also has to do with the people behind the character. So, like if you are appearing as any of the four in a game, video game, LARP game, whatever, it tells something about who you are in real life too. So it's much more complicated than what do I do in the game. It's what I do as a person. So my question is that when you were describing the four uh, categories, it uh, seemed to me that you were describing the extremes of the four categories to, you know, illustrate... Uh, yeah, but so my question is, would uh, all the dysfunctionalities that you described be so bad for the game if the players belong to uh, these categories, but more, you know, in a more mediocre or maybe to the middle? I will answer a question with a question. Okay. <laughs> How much uh, Sedefreude is acceptable? I don't know. <laughs> that's why I asked. It does. <laughs> I, that's why, that, no, no, I, I, don't think, I don't think you can put a clear line to it. Mm. Because are you okay with, you know, 1% of people having a bad day for 1% of people to have just a little bit better day that day? And yeah. would reducing the extremes change that it's still zero sum? Mm. It doesn't matter that it's one is plus 100 and the mm -hmm. other is minus mm -hmm. 100, or if it's minus one and plus one. No, I see your point, yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to say that the killers are not only hiding as achievers, they are also hiding as explorers. And then you get the worst party breakers ever, and you have to spot them the first time that they come to your event, otherwise it will be ruined. There's a story behind this, and I would like to hear it later. <laughs> maybe, maybe with a bottle of Mastica. <laughs> Yes, I think uh, there would be some differences in the you know, moral worldview about how to see people and so on, but uh, 
for now, I just wanted to suggest or comment. Basically, if you translate, you know, outside of the taxonomy about the person type, I would say that you are talking about bullying, about you know, like in classroom bullying, and uh, from my impression, bullying is usually like for people that really want to feel that they have can have influence, like kids that really uh, want to have influence on other people because maybe at home they're shut up out of influence. And well, the easiest way to achieve strong influence on other people and prove to yourself that you're important is hitting someone because you'll see his reaction like that. So, and of course in video games, uh, maybe the only way to, to like achieve this kind of influence is hitting someone because this is the kind of interactions we have in video games. And maybe uh, if you're talking about, if you don't want to shut these people up, you say there is a big percentage of them of them in, in the Balkans, maybe there is a way to, to show and to, to show them how to exert positive influence on other people. Because I like to exert influence on people. I like it when students coming for me eight years after and saying, and saying oh, wow, it's you. I really I remember very well this lesson uh, eight years ago and so on, and I was still... So, yes, uh, if it's about exerting influence, maybe it can be repaired. I will, uh, I, will ask, I will answer again with a question. When that student comes to you and says, oh, I really like that lecture you gave uh, eight years ago, does that change you? Then, you're, then it's not a killer characteristic, it's a socializer characteristic. Okay, I have a question. So, uh, once upon a time, uh, in Croatia, we also had this problem of a lot of killers who ruined other people's experience. On the other hand, uh, at that time, the height of our LARP design was uh, just go in the woods, preferably dressed better than last year, uh, go kill bandits and orcs and perhaps your rivals. So, we could say that uh, the LARP design at the time facilitated that uh, type of players. Nowadays, we mostly have LARPs that don't do that. Uh, and we see far fewer of the killer issues, as you would mention that, because uh, at many of the LARPs played right now in Croatia, going out there outright uh, ruining someone's fun is very much meaningless, both in, uh, both in game, uh, but both in the LARP itself with the plot and uh, with the rest of the stuff that is done, uh, played or felt in the LARP. So, um, not completely, but um, there are even some old killers who joined that LARP, th those LARPs and didn't actually ruin anyone's fun. Fewer of them uh, than they played the old uh, style of LARPs, but that stuff happens. So, what do you think about uh, LARP design facilitating or not facilitating that type, that type of play? So, I had a few more slides that I didn't have to, to cover. Uh, basically, what you said was what I would say next, that killers change, well, which should you belong to, changes by circumstance. Not only by your internal self, but who you are playing with, what the game is about, uh, how much taking, how much care the game organizers have taken to steer you towards or away from a suit. So I am asking these killers that came back after those years, did they still, would you still categorize them as killers based on the definitions? So they have changed suit, they have reformed. They are not a problem anymore. Congrats, we won. <laughs> If you if your game permitted them, yes, this is an ongoing battle. An ongoing battle. I mean, hey, it's kind of like you know extremism. So this is uh, a type of of player definitions, uh, and as you said, it's developed for digital games to begin with. Uh, what like do you think? What does this bring that you won't find in, for example, the GNS model that is also a player style model that is created for role playing game and LARP specifically. Like, what, what is it you see in here that you like? This describes players in a sandbox that have clear goals that are opposed to each other. 
and it describes what bo how buffers are, buffer laps are and vampire laps specifically because you have uh, you have like you, we have seen another presentation that MMO design crops up MMO is just you know the mm, uh, the pro the progress of uh, of uh, uh, mods so it makes sense to go to the original material and see okay what did they do wrong what did they do right how can I apply this to my game but more importantly why I made this talk and I do believe uh, it is a very good tool but of course you can use other, uh, other tools uh, to structure your game if you want to or uh, categorize players for uh, research purposes. I did this to illustrate a point about killers and actually to raise some awareness because a lot of people had that idea in, your, in their minds, like Nicola, like uh, Ivan. Uh, we all thought about this, but we haven't put it into you know words. Okay, the, our problem is with this uh, specific uh, category of players that we will label killers and we will try to reform them. It is a problem that I want to ser to resurface and. Well, uh, Battle's Taxonomy of Players allowed me to do that in a much simpler way. No more questions? Okay. Thank you again. Chris, here we go. <laughs>